will be filled, uh, refilled with the Holy Spirit. It is in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen and amen. 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 Uh, let me just say good morning and good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning. And an early happy new year. Because again, we have full expectation because of God's goodness, he's going to let us see a new year. And let me say this before I start. I did not plan a New Year's Eve watch night, which would have been coming back tonight about 11 o'clock, singing praises and having prayer and reading the scripture. Because to me, that is an old-fashioned watch night service. <laughs> I, I just didn't. But if you all want to, we will. From 11 to 12, when the clock strikes 12 o'clock, we will be through and have seen another watch night. Prayed it in. Have you prayed out the old one? Old oh, year. You know, I... Myself will be up doing a personal watch night service. But like I said, I didn't because you all have been faithful. You stood in here last Sunday and then I'll turn around that Monday. And I'm not saying that that was overworking, but I just did. Now, this, you know, I didn't ask and nobody asked me, were we? So I'm leaving it open. Okay. So you can tell me yes or no. Because now the world is gonna be partying. It's been moder it's been advertising this party, this party plans for a couple of weeks now. <laughs> but anyway, our Sunday school lesson is the conclusion of this month of looking at the people of faith. And yes, we have looked at some notable people and their faith and how they reacted to their faith and answering the call or the, the assignment that God had given them to do. And today we're looking at concluding with the faith of the wise men who traveled very far to see and to worship the newborn baby, the king of the Jews. And it's coming out of Luke, the second chapter in verses one through 12. And then the subtopic is taking risk and re reaping the reward. So let me just kind of do some little background here. Uh, okay, I certainly will, we're 11 o'clock. We'll just give us some scriptures and prayers and keep it moving. Thank you. Um, we can't get enough of praising God. We shouldn't. That's right. Uh, in life, sometimes we may have to choose to do some things that take us out of our comfort zone. Let me say this. Sometimes in life, we might have to choose to do some things that will take us out of our comfort zone. And if I were to ask you, and you're free to chime in, what are some of the things that you've had to do that life's told you to take you out of your comfort zone? And I can look at one that where you've been on a job for a few years, and things in life, had cause to make a decision. Do I stay on this job, not earning enough money to properly take care of my family? Or do I choose to embark upon a new endeavor that would give me the opportunity on uh, the possibility to earn enough to take care of my family? Well, you might say, uh, what does faith come in? We have to believe in ourselves and in God 
And most of all, when we consult with him and in that uh in that endeavor to uh, to to uh say of uh, yes we have to make a change and uh we see we look and then some there's risk involved there is risk involved in it so that uh sometimes we have to take that risk and so that there can be a change. Um, but um, if we do, we're taking in faith. Now, sometimes we even have to take the risk of moving or relocating to another part of the country. But it is a lot of time worth the risk, okay? And all I'm trying to get over before I start is that we have to have faith in our uh, ability to make the change. And what I'm leading up to is this. Our lesson is talking about, is pointing us to the, the wise men who took the risk of traveling those many miles to see and worship the baby Jesus. So let us begin in uh, verses one, two, uh, and looking at who were these men that were seeking the baby Jesus? Because we're going to see about the risk and ask the question, what was that risk? And it reads as follows. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of King, of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Okay, who were these men? These was learned magi uh, men that was mixed with some Sardetarian. It was a strain astronomers, astrologers, who was highly educated and fun functional and, and different court as advisors. They even officiated in religious matters in the Persian Empire. And they were associated with uh, divinators and medians and sorcerers. So the question then become, why were they, or what guided them, and why did they want to see the baby Jesus? Well, they were guided by Jesus' star, the star in the east that shone, that shone, that shone brighter than any star there were in the sky because it was the star of the Savior that God the Father was directing these men to where he was. Now, let me say that it was widely known or prophesied that, that he would be born and that he would, uh, is the savior of the world. And that's why they asked the question as they did, where is he that is born 
king of the Jews. And uh, so, uh, let me, uh, I'm doing some other things here. But I, I just want to try and get over my point is that these men were non-Jewish, but yet they had the heart and the mind and the desire to go and see the baby Jesus. Their intent were good. They had a, a good motive. And they demonstrated their motive when they got found the baby Jesus. Well, who did they ask? They asked the king, King Herod. Well, now, we need to know that he wasn't right. His motive was uh, off kilter, so to speak, because... He got a little upset when they asked him, who is he that is born of the king of the Jews? Okay, well, now listen. King Herod saw his power and position threatened. And I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Uh, when it, so let me read these next three verses. And we're going to look at his attitude when he had heard the news of the true king being born. And verses 3 through 8 reads as follows. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes, of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And when they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for it thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when you have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. Well, as I was getting ready to say that King Herod became paranoid and jealousy, so in his paranoia, became so uh, um, reached a fever pitch till he had his wife, one of his wives killed. And that wasn't good. So um, he, uh, he was uh, I he was just paranoid. And like I said earlier, he saw his power and rulership and secondary to Jesus Christ, the King of the Jews. Okay? Now, When you know who you are and know you have the right motive, there is no room for jealousy. We see that today so prevalent that uh, we get jealous of what we perceive as a title that's a, a better title 
than somebody else. And take, for instance, the superintendent of the Sunday school. Well, if you divided your church school up into departments like one and two, department one could be your, for your adults, and the general superintendent over both departments, well, the department number two being the kids or the young people, they feel like they don't have enough, a much power as the one and the superintendent of department one. Well, that's not about that. You are serving the Lord. My point I'm trying to say here is that Herod's motive was ill-conceived. He wanted to kill the baby uh, child, eliminating his competition. And what may have caused him to get so and in such a state of a paranoia is how the wise men phrased the question, who is this king of the Jews? Where is he? We want to know. Now, they are asking this question because, remember, they are out of town. They're not even Jews. But they wanted to see him, and their motives were good. But if you're an out of town or you don't know exactly who they asked, so they went to the top. They asked the king. And him being of an evil mindset told him he's playing this role of conception. Well, will you let's just go. Who is it? Go find him and tell me, bring me back word to where he is. As soon as you find him, so that they said he was going to worship him, but that was not his intent because that was a decree to kill out all these boy babies in the first place. Well, you know what? Him, the king of the Jews, king, not, excuse me, let me rephrase. Him, King Herod, who was the earthly king at that time, uh, uh, when you, uh, your motive is not really genuine, Everything's upset you. Any kind of you, what you feel as uh, a competition or a threat to your power, you try to eliminate that threat. Well, let's just look at it this time. Well, we've been talking about the true motive of the wise men. They came and watched. They found him because they followed the star of Jesus. Okay. Jesus' star is still shining. Are we following? That's the thing. But they went and worshipped him. They didn't go empty-handed. They brought him gifts. And there were three gifts that is mentioned. Why? That's how his theologians can conclude that it was three wise men. They had gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Okay. Now, gold represents Jesus' status as king, as gold is the most expensive metal. The frankincense represented his deity, and mirth is the embalming oil, which was symbolic of Jesus' death to what was to come on the cross. Now, you see how God working everything and letting everybody know this is my son. He's worthy to be praised and he's worthy of your unconditional true worship. So these wise men demonstrated their true, uh, true motive. They worship and they brought him gifts of significance that's representative of the king. Okay, now, what did this say for you and I today? Uh, for us making a travel to worship. Now, Jesus is no longer in, in that, he's no longer a baby, okay? But the thing is, uh, what are we, 
how are we making the sacrifice to travel? If we had to travel a great distance, are we willing to go and worship? Does he mean that much to us? Does his birth mean that much to us for us to travel? Now, I want you to keep in mind this, that travel today is much different than it was back in those days. They either was by foot or camel, donkey. We have all these super highways and all these jet planes that can get us where we want to go in a matter of hours. Okay? So the question still remains, and I'm not asking you to tell me, I just want you to ponder it in your heart. What a, how far am I willing to travel to worship Jesus? Because if it had not been for his birth and then going to the cross, we would have no salvation. Now, let me make this one last point before I move on and look at God's protection and his same protection. He protects you and I today, just as he protected. But my point here I want to make is that these wise men being non-Jewish, and as we've learned in our previous lesson, and how God used people of different nationalities, or non-Jewish or Gentiles, and his plan of salvation to tell us salvation is for all of us. All you have to do is to believe in his son, Jesus Christ. Your salvation is assured. He demonstrated that throughout the lineage of Christ. These men, these wise men, and I've said this several times, that, that they were not Jewish. They were non-Jewish, but they still worship Cain and worship Jesus. Okay. Now, let me get to my verse 12 here while I still have a few minutes and ask this question. How did God use these men to protect his son? Verse 12 says this, and being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to King Herod, and they departed into their own country another way. Okay. God being all knowing knew the hearts of king, knew the heart of the king. Okay. And his son Jesus was still about this time, history tells us that he was about two years old when he was no longer in the manger. Mary and Joseph was living in a house. Well, Jesus was approximately about two years old, but he was still vulnerable. Remember, the creed had went out to kill those boy babies of a certain age. Okay. God used a dream to warn the Magi, these wise men, of the king's ill intention and said, now listen, I want you all to go and return back to your home country another way, okay? They adhered to God's warning, and they did not go back and tell Herod nothing. They went at home on their way home another way, singing and praising God. They had seen and worshipped the Jesus who was the promised Messiah. And I know I've said this Many, many times that God is all known. He is going to protect his own. And if you take and look at Psalms 91, that entire Psalms talks about God's protection. And it starts off with he who abides in the secret place of the Almighty God, in his tabernacle, 
we will be saved. And I'm paraphrasing. So when God touches the hearts, there's a changed person. These magi, they didn't say they had ever had any in intention other than to come and worship them. Now, they didn't say they was practicing, they were religious folk. They said that they practiced or participated in religious activities of serving as uh, different uh, Irish councils and, and advisors in the court system. Okay. But God still used them because he knew their hearts. Listen, you, man can fool our fellow man 90% of the time because we can put on such an act till we'll have other folks believing, oh, they're just genuine and just as phony as they can be. But let me, let, let me just bring you to some scriptures here of how God touched the hearts of different people, and there was a change. Okay, Matthew 15 and 25 talks about the Canaanite woman who worshiped Jesus. I'm still making my point of faith and people, a non Jewish uh, who worship Jesus, come to know Jesus and were saved. Okay, Matthew 8 and 2 talks about a leper that Jesus healed during his earthly ministry that worshiped Jesus. And I'm all I'm doing here is confirming to everybody that when God touched that heart, there is a change. Okay. Matthew 9 and 18, where a ruler knelt before Jesus. And I'll say this, there is going to come a day when Jesus comes that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that, yes, Jesus is Lord. So that day is coming, okay? So I, I was there to tell you, I said, you need to get busy right now, right now, and, and acknowledge him for who he is. Okay, let me keep on moving here because uh, the mother of the son of Zebedee kneeled before Jesus. You'll find that in Matthew 20 and 20. A demon-possessed man worshiped Jesus. When Jesus uh, cleansed him of his demon Possess mine. That's in Mark 5 and 6. And last, all of the disciples worship Jesus. And if you look at their lifestyle, who they were before they had their Jesus encounter, they were fishermen. Some was tax collectors. And the tax collectors was most despised because they say many of them are cheating the excuse me cheating the people but Jesus still used them when he touched their mind there was a change and let me say this bring it all down to you and I today okay when we were touched by the Lord our minds were changed and we accepted Jesus Christ. Okay. If you don't, I do. I remember the day when I decided that I was going to join, yes, my local church, but the universal church of Jesus Christ because I had, ex I was ex had accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. So what are you saying here? I'm saying here faith in Jesus Christ leads to salvation. There should be no distance for us to travel to worship Jesus. Now, 
What are some of the life applications? Can we get out of this lesson? The wise men took the risk of traveling great distance. And after they found Jesus, they disobeyed the king's order to come back and tell him where the kid baby was. They was rewarded because they was blessed, they was protected, and they had accomplished their mission. Every time we follow Christ and his direction, there is a reward for us because he directs our path. Okay, listen, and when we do that, there is no shortage of God's grace. And I know we've heard this phrase, and it is just as true from the day that I heard it and when it was first encountered till now and will be. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And when we follow God's stuff, it is the sure GPS. Is better than OnStar, Link, and whoever else that these car companies is using as our navigational system. God in his spirit is our navigation system. Because why? Jesus told us in his word, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the light. So the question how far will you travel to worship Christ? There is no boundaries and I witness in Christ. And I know personally, people uh, have relocated to foreign countries as missionaries carrying out their assigned tasks that they had been called to go to other countries in Honduras uh, there's missionaries in Australia. There's missionaries in Pakistan. There's missionaries in Afghanistan. All of these other foreign countries, there is uh, missionaries serving, answering the call. There is no boundaries to how far we should be willing to travel to worship Jesus. Many have gone beyond their comfort zone or their comfort levels to worship Jesus. That's, I have questions or comments on the lesson. We have about one minute, <laughs> one minute to say, what is, what are your questions or comments on this lesson? How does it really apply to you today? And I ask these questions. How far are we willing to travel? Well, I don't, I don't think it's like in physical miles. It's just a spiritual thing, um, distance. I don't think it's measured by feet and miles and stuff like that. Nowadays, especially, I think it's a spiritual thought and how 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 you how far how much you trust in the Lord and all those things. Okay. I could be wrong, but that's just my thought. <laughs> no, this it, it could be both. How are we do we have we have to travel a great distance while we're willing? And mm -hmm. in our spiritual mind, there is no distance exactly. that we should be able we willing to travel. You know, look at Jesus. There were no distance from him. It might have took him 42 generations and got on the nine months train of humanity and got off at the humanity station. There was mm -hmm. no distance. So am I willing to put it all aside to work everything I'm doing, is what I'm saying, to worship Jesus? Okay. I got I got a question. It's probably a dumb question, but the the three wise men, um, they, did they meet at a certain point? 
they didn't always travel from together, right? Well, let me ask you this way. History hadn't told me that they didn't. They, fought, they said it as if they were traveling together. Oh, I didn't know. I just wondered. Yeah, okay. Not that Good question. Sense. Sister Servo, your your questions or comment or your thought? My personal views on this is your own relationship with God will guide you for everlasting. Okay. Think and think, that's what life is all about. Exactly. Exactly. Our relate what is our relationship with the Lord? It calls us to put things aside and go to worship the Lord. That's why I, well, I like I said earlier about worship service uh midnight uh watch night tonight. You know, I didn't, but if you're willing, I'm here, I'll be here. Okay. So Servo said you'll be here, I'll be here. Okay, we're gonna have songs and we're gonna read scripture and pray a prayer. And yeah, thank God for where he brought us from. We didn't get to this point on our own. Okay. Anybody else? No? No more questions or comments. Okay. And I'll close with this one. As we are ending this year, going into a new year, instead of New Year's resolution, make a new renewed commitment that I'm going to serve the Lord in spite of. Okay. Shall we pray? Father God, we thank you for your blessing. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who is the bright and shining star. And open up our eyes, all the eyes who are not clothed, who are not seeing. Open them so they can see his star as it is still shining. And follow the star. And let no distance, physical, spiritual, or otherwise, come between us or hinder our worship being him, because he is worthy to be worshiped daily. And Father God, we thank you for just being God all by yourself. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. And amen. Okay. Mm -hmm.